Hello, everybody. So, welcome to this uh, session on uh, unlocking the potential for mitral and tricuspid uh, clipping. I think it's a very important session because we are going to use all what we have, all what we have available to try to catch some of the subtle differences between doing an okay case and a perfect case. We are going to do this through uh, live demonstrations, uh, sorry, live in a box demonstration of cases, uh, as well as having Andrew Cook with his uh, table full of specimens where uh, we can look at anatomy with the eyes of an interventional cardiologist performing the procedure. Feel free to ask questions if you want. Then we will go and uh, simulate procedures on this high-end simulator from LifeTech and with the very experienced operators. I cannot uh, introduce everybody, I will introduce as we go. We will get some information about the device, so, which is also very important. And we put all together to try really to become a bit better operators. Every day we learn something. So without further delay, I would like to uh, introduce the start of the session. It's gonna be uh, presenting a case which is uh, be, uh, coming from uh, Kion Pedro Lee, who will uh, present us, come here, come here, come in front of me. We'll present this case. It's a case of tricuspid insufficiency. Thank you very much. So uh, I will start presenting this case. This is a, our tricuspid case. <coughs> These are our conflicts of see interest, here. okay? And um, this is the case of a 78-year-old woman with a an, an history of uh, atrial fibrillation, proximal atrial fibrillation, and also uh, a thoracic trauma uh, with a table. Uh, she had an osteoporotic external fracture, so we, we have to think that it was a high-energy trau trauma uh, traumatism. Uh, after this trauma, Trauma, she develops a um, dyspnea on exertion, a uh, functional class two, and we found a um, tricuspid regurgitation. We start with uh, all this treatment, thoracimid, epilerenone, dapaglifosine, and this is the echo. Okay, so in this trans transthoracic echo, we can see a, a good LBA ejection fraction, a good RV fraction. Um, we can identify an eccentric severe TR with a contractor vein of seven millimeters. And moving to the transesophageal uh, imaging, um, we start with this inflow outflow view. At this point, and in this view, we can identify here in the center the papillary muscle, the anterior papillary muscle. It di divides it. it um, the anterior part of this valve is the anterior leaflet, and the posterior part of this valve is the posterior leaflet. So our jet is origin in the center of the, uh, of the valve, just in the, in the center of the papillary muscle. So we systematically, we use the explain moving from the center to anterior and to the posterior part of the valve uh, to check where is the, 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 the jet. Oh, this is in the center of the valve. We can, we can see in the color view how the, the, the jet is, is eccentric to the septal part of the right atrium. And anatomical, the, the anatomy of this valve, we can see a, a good septal leaflet without a restriction of the movement. A slight thickness of the uh, tip of this lateral uh, um, leaflet of the tricuspid valve at probably a small uh, flail <coughs> at this point. So when we move to the anterior part of the valve, there is no uh, al <coughs> any, any kind of tricuspid regurgitation and also in the posterior part of the valve there is no alteration in the mobility and there is no jet at this point. <coughs> So this is our grasping view with, uh, with, with, with the same information, uh, a 
pro, pro, probably this, this is a, a, an organic tricuspid regurgitation, mainly by this small flail of the lateral leaflet. The 3D image helps us to identify the, the location of the jet, just in the center of the valve. This is the, the, the typical uh, position of the tricuspid valve with the aortic valve at, at five o'clock. And then we move to transgastric view. In this transgastric view, it's important to identify this, this papillary muscle to, to separate the anterior part of the valve and the posterior part of the valve. And we can see clearly this jet is, is central, but probably slightly posterior. Uh, and um, and this, this is the, the, the anatomy. So the idea here is, is now to move to the anatomical. Yeah. So thank you very much. So we have seen images, Andrew. Uh, we've been talking about papillary muscle, anterior, posterior. Let's, uh, let's use your uh, skills to help us uh, dry, uh, go through this anatomy. OK, so I'm going to show you some aspects of the valve, of the tricuspid valve, that probably you don't get to see so much um, on imaging. We're going to look at the valve from the undersurface, look at the caudal attachments in just a moment. But first of all, just to look at the, the valve from above, this one, I think you'll agree, has uh, uh, four leaflets. So it has two extra leaflets at the base here. But this is the region I'm going to focus on between the anterior leaflet and the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve, particularly around here, which is the anteroseptal commissure. Now, you'll be aware that that's a very important region because the AV node will be situated just uh, lateral, just at the apex of the triangle of cock, close to that region. So that's the region. What we're going to look at then is the valve from the underside. Uh, so this is a smaller heart, but you can see here that we've got the anterior leaflet here spanning the outflow tract. And it has two points of attachment. The first is uh, the uh, medial papillary muscle, muscle blanchisi. And the second, as you saw in the imaging, is the anter anterior papillary muscle. All right, so that really is the dividing point between the anterior leaflet, which is here, and then the posterior leaflet, which is supported Andrew, in a more complex way. Yeah. Can I ask you just to rotate nine, uh, 90 degrees clockwise? So, exactly. So now Certainly. this is like uh, the same picture we had before in the uh, inflow outflow. So with uh, the pulmonary artery on the right side, the outflow tract there. The aorta in the, in the middle, yeah. Aorta. Yeah. So I mean, this we, is what we see on echo, and is. we guide on our decisions. Eh? It is indeed. I mean, we, we tend to show in anatomic fashion, yeah. but I'm happy to turn this around and show you from this, this way. So this is then the anterior leaflet. This would be the inferior posterior leaflet and the septal leaflet below. And if you look at this anterior leaflet, you can see that actually there's a large cord-free zone in between those two points of attachment. And, and this is the best area really for clipping. It's quite consistent across hearts. Um, unless you've got a really small anterior leaflet, then that is the largest cord-free area for clipping. If you look underneath on the septal leaflet, you'll see there's multiple caudal attachments as I lift that up. Uh, so much uh, narrower regions in between the cords. But wait a second. So this is the, what maybe for most of us is the first time we hear about a cordal free zone for the tricuspid. That is a key element in my opinion, because that is exactly what you mean. If we could see this on echo, this would be the ideal location for our implants. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. So this is the, the easiest area. You can see that cords are running up here and joining onto the annulus. This is a sort of webbed arrangement. The valve is thinner, so we're able to see those cords. And you can see the sort of structural integrity there of the valve uh, supported by, by those, those cords. So um, the easiest clip, as you say, is between this region here, the anterior leaflet, and the septal leaflet uh, underneath. And that will then uh, reduce the orifice, reduce the, the regurgitant jet. Uh, the far more complicated region, of course, is this region, which is more posterior. If I hold the heart in its, in its anatomic uh, orientation, it's actually inferior. So and that is where there is the largest uh, uh, variability in our patients. You know, some patients have two leaflets, some, some patients have more leaflets, and, and yeah. that is why we get a bit in trouble when you go in that direction. Yeah, actually, you can see here that you've got um, 
any number of cords, so between two and five papillary muscles there, rather, supporting this leaflet of the valve, and then giving rise to cords which support the posterior, the inferior posterior leaflet of the valve. And that's why it's a more complex area if you're trying to clip in that region. Yeah, the, the more cords, more papillary muscles, absolutely. it all correlates uh, can, quite nicely. Can, can I ask you one thing? What is this? Very good point. So actually what you see, there's a circle here formed by the two points of the attachment here going down the septum marginal trabeculation, and this is the moderator band. Okay? Okay. So the moderator band will carry on its, on its edge here the distal part of the right bundle. So the Purkinje system will run literally on top of this bundle and then run towards the right ventricular free wall. So it's a very important structure, very important not to damage. Um, and of course, if you're going deep into the right ventricle, then you can impinge on that structure. But yeah, there's a loop formed like that. That's a small area during development as this leaflet is developing and then it enlarges and those two points of attachment move away from each other. One last question. I mean, in this picture, is, in this uh, image, it's very clear there are at least two nice chordal free zones. One is anterior, one is in, in this posterior uh, segment. Show us uh, the chordal distribution of the, tri of the septal. This is the problem we have. Show us the, how many chords are on the septal. Yeah. Let me turn it around again in, in uh, your orientation. So if I lift that up, and I'm sure you'll see this nicely on the simulator, there you can see the multiple chords. So they're, they're not just at the free edge, they're also what we call struck chords or secondary chords to the body of the underside of the leaflet. And that's the last leaflet to peel away from the myocardium and is quite variable in its attachment and its degree degree of delamination from the myocardium. And that is a bit uh, our challenge. I mean, you know, the essence of edge-to-edge -edge procedure is that you need to be uh, symmetric in the, in the opposing leaflets. And if uh, you don't get in the right track inside of these tiny uh, spaces, then you get some deformation. That's why after we, we put the first clip in the anteroceptal commissure first, we check if there is any asymmetry by checking there is no, MR, uh, no TR happening close by. Thank you so much. We need to move forward now. We will come back to you when we go to Mitra, because now we can uh, ask uh, Maurizio and uh, the Marzi, Mart ah, Martis, uh, Martis ones. Uh, helped by Romitelli. Uh, so we have seen the case. It's a case where the uh, TR comes probably fro from this uh, trauma. There was probably a small rupture of the, of the corda. And the TR is anteroceptal. So uh, show us how you would uh, perform this procedure. Yes, here you can see on the screen there is the beating heart simulator. Uh, there are some differences between this heart and a human heart, but I think for the purpose of, of this demonstration is extremely helpful because you see the valve from above, so from the right atrium, the so-called surgical view, and then we see the valve from below. So we see live the chordal distribution, how dense they are, especially close to the papillary muscle, close to the commissure, as we have seen on the specimen. And, uh, and then we have also the echo. So the echo, which is actually guiding the procedure in reality. This is a RV inflow with X-plane, which is the view that is used in reality. Let's say that uh, now the clip is already above the chordal free zone in the anteroceptal portion of the valve, which would be the target in, in this specific patient. But obviously, we need to, to get there with, with the clip first. And, uh, Having the tri-clip dedicated delivery system is allowing us to go there extremely in a straightforward way with good trajectory and really minimal manipulation. So the procedure is extremely safe. And once you are above our target, guided by ECHO, obviously, then we check that our trajectory is coaxial and uh, we are actually ready to... Uh, Paolo is now checking the trajectory. We open the clip and we position ourselves perpendicular to the line of coaptation. In this case, the anteroceptal line of coaptation. As Francesco said before, the key for the success in edge-to-edge -edge repair is respect the symmetry of the valve. Which is the key difficulty we use uh, in, in real life. We use a lot of uh, 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 transgastric views. We use uh, 3D, but 3D doesn't work really in most of the cases because of the position of the esophagus. And but sometimes in tricuspid, as you said, there is a lot of variability. We have seen one heart with four leaflet configuration. So we really need to take into account the, the, the different anatomical uh, possible variation of the valve and, and respect them. 
when we when we orient our clip arm. So Romitelli is uh, the most experienced operator with uh, uh, with this. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've done this so many times with you. So are you you know what to do now? Can we cross? Yes. Let's go. Let's have a look. So what we do, we cross. Uh, uh, by the way, on the on the left on the right side picture, which is anterior, which is posterior? Sorry, is like a transgastric or what? Anterior is on top in that video. Here. On on the camera or what? It's like transgastric. So. On top, we have posterior then. Yes, on the right, we have the septal, and on the left, we have the anterior. anterior like perfect. So it's like a transgastric view. So now the clip is below the leaflet. Paolo crossed the valve with uh, the clip closed, which is, a, let's say, a safety precaution in order to, to avoid to get entangled. And now he's opening again the clip below and just trying to get as much leaflet as possible in the clip arm. And now the gripper are dropped down. So once you do this, uh, the first closure I just mentioned, usually what we do, the first clip is key element. If it is asymmetric, it's a problem. Yeah. So usually we, now we would uh, uh, use the color, uh, Martin, yeah. correct? And if there is Emma, if there is TR, we should reposition, correct? Absolutely. A little bit, of course, depends on, but sometimes you have a, a, a rigors from the full line of cooptation. But what, what you frequently try to do is put it in the antral septal, check if at least nothing is more coming out of exactly. the commissure. So that's what you don't want, because getting below another device is actually quite difficult. So you want to stay above. So if that and also that because, you know, the older school, uh, you remember this, we had done so, so many times. <laughs> if you start wrong, it's going to be wrong, the whole procedure. Okay, this is a point. Anyhow, uh, so are you happy with this or you want to reposition? I think uh, this clip looks in a good position. That means that we are more or less in the cordal free zone of the tricuspid anteroceptal portion, which is not too close to the commissure, not too close to the center. It seems that the symmetry of the leaflet is respected, so we are perpendicular to the, to the line of captation. Obviously, what is missing here is the evaluation of the leaflet insertion. In reality, we would check carefully in ECHO if we have enough leaflet inside. Otherwise, we would eventually optimize leaflet insertion. But if the leaflet insertion is okay, then, and there is no residual jet between the clip and the commissure, we would probably re deploy this clip and eventually put a second one. So now the point is, uh, let me ask uh, Anya to help us. You know, uh, Anya is uh, our uh, expert on device, so she will tell us one important, I have a question for you. So the tricuspid is very, is really tiny, very soft mm -hmm. tissue. How dangerous is, is, I reopen the clip arms and I grasp twice, three times, and maybe I'm not, I don't see well. What, what is yeah. the effect on so, this so, on leaflets? So, so there is a key feature in the triclip device that ensures safety and efficacy um, on the tricuspid valve. And that key feature is the gripper. Yeah. Yeah. So our gripper, which is this element here, um, is made out of a nitinol material. Um, and it has frictional elements. Now those frictional elements are these little points here. Can we go below the camera? Come here, come with me. Can you give us a bit of space? Okay, do it under camera. Can we have the camera? This is the top camera. So this is the gripper with those frictional elements. Um, and those frictional elements um, are distributed along the full length of the gripper, which means they're not concentrated when, in one area. If they were concentrated in one area, that would be a stress concentration point. Um, and a another key thing is that we have frictional elements on the inner part of the gripper. Now this ensures that you have maximum leaflet coaptation and maximum TR reduction. Another key design element with the gripper is the length of the frictional elements. Now those frictional elements are, are, the length of them is determined by the thickness of the tissue. So we ensured that those frictional elements are shorter than the thickness of the tissue. And that makes the gripper um, not penetrate the tissue, not damage the tissue. It acts like Velcro to gently secure the tissue inside the clip. Yeah, Anya, so this is nice, you know, marketing proposition. Let's see if this is true. Let me show. Let's try a gripper uh, on, on our specimen, can we? Let's see what is the effect. So let's, let's imagine we are doing multiple grasping. 
mm -hmm. maybe a bit less. Should, should I go around? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I'll go around the other yeah. side. Um, <coughs> Maybe I can do from here, it's easier. Mm -hmm. So, okay. is it a tricuspid or a mitral? This is tricuspid. Tricuspid, sorry, I don't know exactly anatomy. I'm a bit <laughs> so, I will grasp here the anterior, mm -hmm. correct? And I need to, sorry, I need to drop the grippers like this. There you go. And then I close the clip. Mm -hmm. Now, Marty, can you do echo here? It's not yeah. good, eh? Yeah, that's it's not good. Thank you. So then I have to reopen the clip, lift the grippers, and reposition. Yep. And you see there is no big sign, maybe... If you look at the tissue, there's no, um, there's no obvious indentation of the tissue or... Uh, defects within the tissue there, so it's um, at least at the magnification we can, we can see there. You can see the the, the linear yep. uh, horizontal line there. There's really no no impact on. Uh, obviously, this is a, a, a specimen with formalin, but actually, it's it's, a, it's something that probably we don't realize when we do these procedures that the, the gripper uh, uh, themselves, they're really very soft and, and out-traumatic. So uh, multiple repositioning, it is possible. Obviously, you need to be very careful when you move around the cores. You can still get entangled, get uh, in trouble. But it's not about uh, managing the closure system. Thank you, Anya, very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. First of all, it's a bit, it's always like, you know, you watch it, you don't say anything. If you want to ask questions, you can always ask questions. You just raise, raise your hand and I try to catch you. And then you can ask your question with this. You want anyone as a question? No questions. Very good. Thank you. We are late. So let's go. <laughs> so uh, if you understood more or less the, uh, the concept that we have, uh, we try to uh, deliver, let's see how this procedure went forward. So, David, the real thing. So, I think the first thing that we need to know is that uh, it's really important how Pedro analyzed the, the tricuspid so you can understand what's going on and what's the strategy. So, in her particular case, as you realize, there was a small flay. Can we have a slides? But the patient had, at the same time, had a past history of atrial fibrillation. So, it makes some sense to at least try to do the first uh, attempt, uh, trying to have a good catch in the anterior septal. As we said, it's a really safe position. I think it's a position that you don't have anything to lose. I think it's a good idea when you don't have clear the strategy to go there, and after that you can decide. I think it's a good investment. And if you are not uh, in the right spot, you can open it and go to another place. So I think, I think you already comment, Francesco, I think it's key getting this really coaxial position. So for doing that, in most of the cases, you have to play with the wheels. What normally happens is that you, you have this sort of trajectory that comes from lateral towards septal. So with that, with a lateral a wheel, you give some lateral and you can get this straight position. So you are pointing just in between the two leaflets, leaflets as you so, can see here. So coaxiality is a key element. Just let me, let me uh, repeat and clarify for the audience. Why do we talk about coaxiality? This, have you seen the complexity of the chordal distribution? It is about one millimeter difference. If you go left or right one millimeter, then you're already in a bad position. Mm. Being coaxial allows you to go exactly where you want. If you don't have a coaxial alignment, if you are not coaxial to the, uh, to the long axis of this very complex uh, structure, which is the right ventricle, then you are in trouble because you could go in a place which is not the one that you want to target. So coaxiality first, and then you think about grasping, yes. correct? And indeed, there is another point that sometimes you can grasp tissue, but the system is so tight that it can look like you have a good result. So if you, want, you, don't, you don't have any surprise at the end, I think the coaxiality also helps you to, have, to be more predictable in the releasing of the device. So here, as you can see, we did an attend. You can see clearly in the transgastric view that it looks a good spot. It's anteroceptal. We are anterior to the, to the papillary muscle. 
but uh, when we got the space, we have a good grasping. You can see a good, a really nice NPR reconstruction. You can see that we have leaflets. We are sure that we have a good grasping. There is a good pyramid. But despite that, we are not, you know, fixing anything. I think there is. Uh, we can agree that it looks exactly the same as we were at the beginning. So in this particular case, there wasn't a large dilatation of the annulus. We thought, we really believed that it was post-trauma. So it's a primary TR. So the thing is that you have to fix that point that it's, it's uh, lacking. No? So that's the reason why, and it maybe you know, in other case that there was annular dilatation, we leave this clip to work after behind, but we didn't thought that this was a good idea because we weren't gaining anything with this clip. So what did you do then? So we switched the position. We switch, okay, let's see what did you do. So we do is, you can... So you target the lesion then? That's right. Okay. And indeed, there is a read, this transgastric view is really, really beautiful because you can see that our catheter now is behind the papillary muscle. So we are working septal and lateral, but this lateral leaflet probably is the posterior, that is, this was the one with the flail. Okay. So we are working there, we have a good... So kind of a surprise, because we were thinking it was an anterior, now it's a, it was the part of the posterior. That's there right. So it's just, as Petro described, it's just in the middle, it's just over the papillary muscle that the sure. patient got the rupture. So we go there, we have a good grasping, but the problem is that still we are having some residual regurgitation, as you can see. But if you check, probably the reason is that we are not catching the leaflet, uh, with the septal leaflet properly. So what we use is one of the advantages of the device is that the individual grasping. So we kept, we kept the lateral because we had a good amount of tissue. And what we do is we got a bit deeper, go to our septal, bending a little bit the catheter, and with that we got a better grasping. And once we are there, we had a good catch. Indeed, you can, even without Wonderful. the color, you can see already a nicer pyramid in both sides. And with that, it comes the reduction of the TR clearly with almost no MR, no TR. So my, many of the... Uh, uh, physicians who are starting this procedure have some difficulty to interpret that uh, uh, sh a short axis view on transgastric. Uh, Andrew, we are here. So why don't we help you help us? Let's take again the, the specimen and let's see exactly where this clip has been placed. In, uh, you know. Can we check camera here again? Sorry, we are changing the, the, the flow, but I think it's good. Exactly. Um, so so the first clip was done in the anterior, anterior and yeah. was in the cordal free zone, correct? Cordal free zone, David? the front. That's right. Yeah. And then you move posterior. So That's between, right. uh, I guess in this cordal free zone here, so on the other side of the anterior papillary muscle, you'll see there's another arc there, which is smaller, but that's a cord free zone. And then, and then down here to the posterior part of the septal leaflet. So you always, of course, have to, to grasp to the septal leaflet. So in this, in this uh, commissure, so postero, um, Posteroceptor. And probably the cord rupture was actually this. One of these? I think <laughs> it was this one. Okay. Because it was very central. That's right. Okay. It was uh, affecting the uh, ma most anterior portion of the, of the uh, posterior leaflet. Posterior leaflet, yeah. Because you can see cords here coming from one point supporting both leaflets. They, they fan out and sure. they and they support both the free edge and the underside of the leaflet. In fact, they're running all the way to the annulus there. So one of those, a small uh, cord here, if it ruptures, yeah, will give you that uh, level of regurgitation, sure. Excellent, so take away. Let's see, we have, uh, <laughs> you came, you were busy in another room. So what did you, what do you get from this case? Yeah, so I think the cases and what we, the case and what we've seen so far have illustrated the safety of the triclip system that Anya has showed us in terms of the frictional elements. Respecting the anatomy is important, I think, as we've seen, particularly when there's degenerative pathology. And whilst the anatomy is complex, the team have clearly achieved a very effective reduction or obliteration of tricuspid regurgitation in this particular patient. Excellent. I think I also would uh, uh, have another take-home message is that, uh, you know, uh, the clinical history sometimes is not interesting. But in this case, understanding there was a trauma, right. you are looking for a cordial rupture and asymmetric jet. Right. That was changing your, your decision making. Probably uh, many others would not have been changing that first clip. It was a good idea. Thanks a lot. And let's move to the other valve. We go from right to left. In the meanwhile, you see the life tech team is working. I mean, it's amazing to see how they do this. And they told me that they can uh, use multiple times these hearts. How old is this art? Uh, two, years. two years old. 
They are deers, no? Uh, deer hearts. De deer is the one with the horns. All right. So we change, uh, uh, change VAD, we change also team. Uh, we have uh, uh, Kaufman, who is presenting the case. So um, we would like to show you the case of a uh, 82 years old Swiss gentleman. Um, who is chronic three vessel coronary artery disease. He underwent cabbage in 94 and PCI of the right coronary artery in 2005. His ejection fraction is 40%. He's permanent bradycardic atrial fibrillation for which he has had an implant of a leadless pacemaker and microsystem in 2021. And he has also peripheral art arterial disease, spinal stenosis, chronic kidney disease, and this makes up for a year score of 18.5%. He has been hospitalized several months ago for cardiac decompensation and now suffering from chronic dyspnea, this neocard association 2 to 3. Uh, the coronary angiography shows no relevant new stenosis, and he's on a medical treatment, guideline-directed medical treatment in maximal uh, doses. Uh, heart rate is 82, so well controlled. Blood pressure is normal, actually in the lower range. Uh, the ECG shows atrial fibrillation and there's permanent RV pacing. These are the lab values, most important. Uh, renal failure, high anti-pro BNP, slightly elevated troponins, hemoglobin slightly low. So here the echo, um, you see the uh, Pointer working. So uh, uh, the four chamber view transthoracic shows a very severe mitral regurgitation, uh, goes into all pulmonary veins. Uh, and the uh, transits of a GL echo again shows you also severely dilated left atrium. There's restriction of this posterior leaflet uh, and also a pseudo prolapse of the anterior leaflet, and you can actually appreciate the gap here between the two leaflets that underscores the severity of this mitral regurgitation. Uh, posterior leaflet is 13 millimeters, and there's the dilated annulus of 39 by 46 millimeters. On 3D echo, again, you can appreciate the uh, gap here that leads to the severe mitral regurgitation. This is a central uh, regurgitation. The mitral valve area on multiplane reconstruction was 6.2 centimeters square. And so the patient was discussed in our heart team uh, with the option of continuing guideline directed medical therapy, surgery, uh, um, mitral uh, tear uh, intervention or transapical mitral valve regurgitation. And while we discuss uh, the options, uh, I'd like to invite you to make up your mind what you should do in this patient. Of course, this is a uh, tear session, but still make up your mind and maybe there are other options as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. There was a question, uh, it was about tricuspid anatomy, hopefully. If yeah. it is anatomy, you are allowed to ask a question. Okay, uh, thank you for the slot. Uh, I, I'd like to ask about, uh, because we agree that you need to reach uh, symmetry in the commissures. So when you're uh, trying to fix a defect or a gap in, the, in between the posterior and the septal leaflets, and you've got two posterior leaflets, which is quite common, uh, type 3B of Hans classification, what uh, would you be your clockwise or your clocking for the device, please? So the, I would like to answer to this with something really... I, I think this is really a piece of art to some extent. We don't have the answer. You know what could be the answer in the future? CT scan. We, if, if we can't see the subvalvular apparatus, yeah, understanding symmetry is very complex, and the reason it is complex in the posterior. Uh, maybe you can show again the multiple papillary muscles in that in that region, which is uh, the real problem here. Can we show the? Okay. So since you have a lot of papillary muscles, a lot of cordal free zones, each each papillary uh, each uh, cordal free zone is uh, supported by the two papillary muscles, 
And so the line of cooptation is a very complex, uh, uh, multiple uh, line structure, which is making our life difficult, to be honest. That's why the easiest procedures are the ones where TR comes mainly from the anteroceptal commissure. All right, so, but let's go back to the mitre. So, uh, I apologize for jumping, but it was a good, good question. Um, so, the mitre, this is a ischemic MR. Or yep, I'm going to show ischemic MR um, in a moment. I'm just going to show you the mitral from the atrial side, first of all, because I want to focus on uh, the P2, uh, P3 area. So, as I've got it oriented, this is the left atrial appendage at the top. This would be P1. P2 and then P3. As you'll see, there are folds between the leaflets. And you can see here, just want to focus on that, this is a so-called cleft between P2 and P3. And you can see there's leaflet tissue underneath there. This would be the anterior leaflet on the top. So hold that image in your head for a second, and I'll show you the pathologic uh, e example. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Um, to show you that this one has a very large inferior infarct. In fact, you can see the thrombus sort of filling that. So all of the inferior posterior wall, if you like, is, is uh, infarcted. And you can see then that that's resulted in, in thinning there of the lateral wall. So just to... Just, just to orient ourselves just a little bit. Okay, like this. This is the heart. Okay, nice. It's easy okay, and then you can see here the wall is thinned. It's also fibrotic on the inside there. And this is then, this would be the region then of P3. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and then this is the anterior leaflet, so A, A3, A2, and A, A1 at the top. Um, so what you can see actually is because this part of the wall would be uh, immobile effectively or poorly mobile, I think you can see that on the image there, then that's going to have the result of pulling the papillary muscle uh, attachments and group towards that wall and effectively tethering the leaflet. So obviously it's a challenge to show you that in a fixed heart, but you can see even with this uh, dissection that the posterior leaflet is being pulled in this direction. And then of course the anterior leaflet will expand to meet that, and that's what you saw with the with the prolapse. But even in this uh, complex anatomy, you already realize that the chordal distribution is a little bit more uh, simple to interpret than in the tricuspid, correct? I mean, you have a larger chordal free zone here. You, you have a call free zone. I mean, the posterior leaflet is a challenge. So what you'll have is you'll um, develop hooding uh, between the caudal attachments. And you can see that here. So you have small regions, maybe two or three millimeters in between those, uh, those hoods. Sometimes they're larger than others. Um, then you've got, you do have a sort of cord free, a fairly cord free zone in the center of the anterior leaflet there. Um, but you've got multiple cord-free zones. I think that's the point. And you have this, this, uh, this sort of space between the small, the small hoods. Come. Yeah. Andrew, yes, a quick question, because this is something for the practice. And the leaflets, the mitral leaflets, they look a, little, a bit thicker than the tricuspid ones. Is it right? Um, that's a, so that's an acquired uh, pathology. They start off as really thin, as equal a thickness. And yes, then you'll see them thicker on the mitral side. You'll see that with the hooded regions, much thicker. Now, you can, of course, see that on the tricuspid as well. And that tends to be in the cases with tricuspid uh, regurgitation. So you see thickening and hooding on the tricuspid side in the sphere end of disease. Yeah. Because my question comes, because my feeling is that the tricuspid leaflets, they're a bit thinner and they behave in a more plastic or elastic way. And that's important because we don't use individual grasping often in the mitral side, but we use it almost systematically in the tricuspid side. So we need to hold the tissue and, and pull it. So it's, uh, we're talking about the safety. So to me, it makes, it's really important to know if you, if in the pathology, you, if the tricuspid leaflet is more plastic, I would be I, a bit more aggressive on those cases. I mean, plastic is, is challenging. It will be more collagen, so therefore it will be more elastic. Um, but there are changes with, with age. So you can see this, this leaflet here, the tricuspid. This is the septal leaflet. And that's slightly hooded and slightly thicker, but it's nowhere near as thick as we were seeing on the left side. And again, that leaflet is becoming hooded there and, and thickened towards the, the anterior edge. So there are changes with, with disease, yeah, for sure. So in, uh, in the case like the one we have seen, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, mainly posterior lifted tethering, uh, 
the question will be where to grasp again, because, you know, in, in principle, MR comes from the P2, P3 region, and this is a challenging area because of the chordal distribution. Yeah, and, and as I was showing you, uh, chordal distribution and then also the potential for the, the clefts that we are looking at. So again, so opening up this, this other heart, you can see here's the anterior leaflet. This would then be P3 and this would be P2. And can you see there in between those hoods, you've got potentially a, a cleft. If you look that from above, yeah. I wouldn't call that a cleft myself. It's an accentuated fold effectively, but it's between these thickened and hooded regions. And it's, and it's then, where do you place your clip so you're not opening up that cleft and you're, you're actually reducing the regurgitation? But that, show, can, we, can we work together and show the cleft area? So you pull on one side, I pull yeah. on the other side. Yeah. There you go. So, okay. so what you see actually, it's not... It's like a, a commissure, no? It's, it's a commissure. There's thin leaflet tissue in between those two hoods. So it's all supported by valve tissue. It's just from above, it looks like uh, there's a cleft that runs all the way to the annula. So it's an accentuated fold, etc., um, essentially, and it's accentuated because of the hooding and thickening of the leaflets, and that, of course, is determined by the caudal attachments. But, so you know, guys, you look at this picture and remember this picture in your career. Never try to grasp leaflets in where the jet comes from in functional MR. You know, the largest jet happens to be in these folds because there is less tissue. The, 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 uh, the height of the leaflet is the shortest at the level of the clefts. Here is where you have the most uh, concentrated uh, pizza. You know, the most, uh, you know, the most flow goes from there. So in the past, we were saying, okay, you go in the middle of the jet, grasp the leaflets, and it resulted often in a no-go. No you were unable to grasp because there is not enough tissue, or even we can accentuate the uh, M MR because we create a lot of distortion. So it's very important to show really this thing. So you're saying that you wouldn't grasp around this region, you wouldn't necessarily grasp P3 and, and A3 because that's going to potentially open up that junction there, that cleft, yeah. if you like, I local cleft, and maybe better to, to, to uh, join P2 to A2. That's exactly a good transition to the simulation here in the live tech because I believe that the best way is to start A2P2 and the reason is that there is no uh, tax to pay. If you make a mistake, you can go back, release the clip arms and, and start again. If you go A3P3, Andrew, if you go in this region, you are somehow committed. You, may, you might be entangled in this very dense corridor distribution. So let's see how do we get into the cordal free zone here in the mitral. It's easier, come on. Yeah, it's definitely better easier. imaging, easier cordal free zone. Uh, we replicated also the retraction of the posterior leaflet in, in this heart, so the, it simulating really the real case. And actually, as you said, the, the ideal location is in A2P2, even if the jet is slightly medial. And most of the time, it's really effective. You can restore the coaptation of all the valve by doing that. So now. Paolo put the clip uh, exactly in the middle of the valve, so in the A2P2 region. And uh, obviously, the same principle that we mentioned before for the tricuspid are true also for the mitral. So symmetry is extremely important, and trajectory as well. So being coaxial is also depending on the transeptal puncture, obviously, in mitral. Uh, here, the transeptal puncture has been already done, let's say. But if you have a proper transeptal puncture, you can approach the mitral valve with coaxial trajectory in most of the cases, and then you put yourself above your target zone, so again, A2P2 in this case, and you can open the clip arm. Uh, Martin, are we coaxial? Uh, coaxial, no, yeah, if, we, if we cannot completely see, if we axial aligned, we would be pointing towards the apex, and it seems like here, we're pointing a little bit from medial to lateral on the left side, so again, for the people not knowing it, can we get a cursor, or can I get a cursor? Good. So what we can see, so we have medial and lateral, and we can see a little bit when he moves up and down, it comes from the medial side and dives into laterally. So it doesn't seem to have a straight path towards the, the apex here, but it might be the deer anatomy that might be causing this. So normally what you would say is that you would advance, so use a little bit more of M knob to dive straight in towards the apex. So by, again, very important here is the fact that prior to attempt grasping, we need to be sure that we are 
you know, moving straight. Otherwise, you like uh, driving the car when you're drunk. All right. Especially with the bigger clip. So it, it's nice when the clip is still attached to the, to the system itself. But if you dive in with an angulation, first of all, you can get into the corda. But also is the problem when you release the device, it has a tendency to tilt down. Tilt and then down. you make it even worse. So being actualized, paying attention to that, I think is a crucial first step. And then the perpendicularity. So then we open now the clip arms, correct? Yes, you open the clip arm and you check the perpendicularity of the clip arm to the line of captation. So in this case, being in A to P2, usually you just point uh, 6 and 12 o'clock. And then after checking your gripper, obviously, you, you can actually advance the clip. Paolo, close the clip is a good practice. Um, in mm. A to P2, there is no cordal density below, so you can eventually also consider to advance the clip without completely close it. What is important is not to lose the clocking. So we check the clocking, the perpendicularity of the clip arm in the left atrium. We don't want to lose this while we cross. So it's extremely important to check it again before grasping the leaflet. Now Paolo is below the leaflet. The clip is again open. And now the next step is obviously to try to, to grasp enough anterior and posterior leaflet. In an anatomy like this, usually anterior is quite easy to grasp, while posterior, which is retracted and slightly shorter, could be eventually more difficult. Probably show it uh, often, but we can, we'll do it. Let's see. Now the leaflets are above the clip arm, and I think you measure, if you are happy with leaflet insertion, you can actually grasp. So you dope your gripper, and then you close. While you close, it's extremely important to release the tension on the catheter, especially if there is retracted posterior leaflet, like in this case, and dilated annulus, because you can eventually damage the leaflet if you don't do the proper yeah. release of the tension. To be honest, uh, uh, Paolo, I think it's a bit asymmetric. Uh, I don't like it too much, uh, but let's see. Uh, Marty, tell us. No, I agree. Uh, again, we can look at... Yes, yeah, this guy, you know, it's, it's, you are doing this since ages. I done my purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's fine. It's just for, but you know, on the other hand, uh, there is a bit of uh, of uh, asymmetry. Yeah. Maybe you can check it also. On, uh, you've been using the NPR. Yeah, before, maybe huh? good to show indeed because we saw with the X plane that we couldn't be completely aligned with the catheter, and I think that's yeah. where the nice benefit is. We learned it actually more from the tricuspid field, but we're using it as well in the NPR on the mitral field as well. But now we can nicely align all the catheters and have an even better. Uh, grasping view on the right side than we had before. I think that's really nice, the, the benefit. And the nice thing also, normally you can have a short axis at the same time, so you can check your perpendicularity at the same time as your path. So, uh, thank you. Great. And now actually, actually, uh, Paolo, very good. You've, you saved uh, your, uh, your career. <laughs> we will invite you again. Thank you so much. <laughs> but what is beautiful about this life tech, you know, look at how the cords now are symmetric and, and, the, and the valve is opening and closing. Uh, symmetrically. This is very important for efficacy, but also probably for durability of this repair. Um, now, what we see is a really nice leaflet insertion as well. Can you see how this clip is there and uh, uh, how the leaflets are incorporated? This is what we need to achieve. But also, in these cases, it could be very important to uh, select the right device. So, for instance, Maurizio, in, a, in such a case that we have seen before, is a ischemic MR with uh, a lesion, and probably, what, would you target A2P2 first? I would definitely target A2P2 first. And would you, would you use a small clip, large clip, NT, NTW, XT, or whatever? There is a lot of discussion. Many operators prefer to use, by default, NTW in, uh, in ischemic MR. I'm not actually afraid of using an XTW if there is enough leaflet length and if there is no risk of stenosis. And uh, so in a case like the previous one, I would probably have used an XTW. But I mean, I, NTW would work as well. And why do, why do we discuss this? Is because obviously uh, uh, clip uh, uh, device selection plays a role, particularly in FMR, I think is an important discussion. We still have debate. 
Anya, can you uh, uh, elaborate a little bit on this yes, topic? Yes, yes, absolutely. I'm just um, waiting for my slide. Yeah, so, so MitraClip G4 comes with four clip sizes, allowing you to customize the therapy to your um, patient's anatomical needs. The NT and the NTW clip size is 15 millimeters in length and has a wingspan of 17 millimeters. The XT and the XDW clip is 18 millimeters in length and has a wingspan of 22 millimeters. Now the NTW and the XTW clip is our wider clip sizes. These clips are 50% wider in the grasping area and this really provides you with two key benefits. The first key benefit is it's greater MR reduction. There's a larger coaptation area which results in greater MR reduction. But the other key benefit is that tensile force is distributed among a larger area. And so you're minimizing that tension on the leaflet. Um, the MitraClip G4 system also has is a mechanical system. So it actively um, reduces the annular AP dimension and in doing so fully restores leaflet coaptation. And, and so you can select your clip size to manage MR in balance with that AP dimensional change. And that is an important uh, uh, aspect uh, of uh, also the decision making in such a procedure. Is it ischemic MR, maybe the MR is mainly posterior in the, towards the posterior medial commissure, but we still go for A2P2 because is, even if it is not in the center of the jet, we are actually acting on the AP dimension. We are doing an indirect annuloplasty to some extent. Why don't we go and see the case, uh, how it's been uh, uh, managed, so you can show us and then we can still discuss a little bit. Uh. Yeah, so we discussed our patient in our heart team and uh, we decided to go for edge to edge repair. Uh, because our patient was very frail, you remember the Euro score was 18% and the patient was very symptomatic and despite optical, optimal medical therapy, he was still symptomatic and we could not increase his medication. So that's why we decided to go for edge-to-edge -edge repair and avoid surgery or TMVR. And as you predicted, Francesco, we wanted to go more immediately, but when we did that, the regurgitation was not significantly improved, so there was still severe regurgitation. So we decided then to do multiple attempts and went then to more to the center of the valve. And what was actually very easy with the XTW, we also decided to take an XTW to grasp the posterior leaflet. It was long enough and you can see here nicely that it was possible to grasp both of them at the same time. And we were able to reduce the jet but we had a gradient of about five at that point, so we did uh, multiple attempts to improve it a bit more, but then we decided not to put in a second device, given that we reduced it massively compared to this massive jet, as you have seen before. And actually, the patient came just back a few weeks ago, and you can still see that there is some residual regurgitation. Gradient was now four, and clinically, the patient massively improved. You see here the picture before and after, the SPUB measured by TTE uh, improved and also the patient was doing much better now. So he was tolerating now a higher dose of medication, so his dyspnea improved, he had no more heart failure hospitalizations, he had only minimal lack edema and it's also his NTPMP improved. So I think we made the right decision but we can discuss that to leave just one device there with having a residual MR of grade one or two, but a gradient of only four. Yeah, Thomas, I think you, you, you really demonstrated how, you know, for safety, you went in the middle of the valve, easy procedure, reproducible, and you obtained a, a great reduction of MR. Still a little bit of MR coming from the cleft, you know? That is exactly yeah. where it comes from. And uh, let me just go back to the, uh, to the uh, specimen. Let's see on uh, here. Why going A2P2 makes sense? I have to tell you a, a story about this. You know, when I started CLIP many years ago, yeah, I see <laughs> Victoria said no. <laughs> when, I say, when I started clipping in my career, uh, I was together with Antonio Colombo. I don't know if Antonio is here, I hope he's here. But anyhow, and I remember at the beginning, clipping was like uh, two, three hours, and it was, you know, in the, in the cat lab, Antonio was getting nervous. He was in behind my neck and say, what are you doing? Yeah, we're trying to align to the uh, MR jet. You see, this is a posterior media. There is an asymmetric jet, whatever. We're discussing it. And then he comes and says, you know, to, you have to put it in the middle. And I thought it was a 
stupid idea. Why Mito? He's on the other side. You have to put it in A two P two. Go. He was right. You should put it in the middle first, and then Antonio is always right. So. So if you look at this region, you look at the A2 region, you can see there's a, there's a bare area where there's no cords. You've got cords coming from either papri muscle. But this region here, so if you put your clip in here, for example, um, then it's very easy, isn't it, to grasp that leaflet. You've got probably, you know, a good five millimeters or so there where you could grasp. Um, if in, alternatively, if you're in this region, so if you're more inferior, um, first, then you can see that actually the heads of the very muscles fan out like the fingers of hand of your hand, and they give rise to those cords. So they're really curving in an arc, and that's why it's much more complicated uh, to grasp in this in this location. And as you find, you've then got to be very careful how you manipulate the and, the, the clip off. And, and I tell you something. I teach you something as well. So next time, maybe you do a, a clip yourself. <laughs> You know, you. one thing that somebody's doing, once you cross the valve, you, re you, you recheck your clocking, okay? This is doable, easy to be done here in the corridor free zone. Do it. It's not a problem. But if you cross here with any asymmetry and you have the clip open and you are crossing with one, one clip arm in one uh, region and the other one in this region, you can clock as much as you want, but as you pull up, you will, sorry, this is, as you pull up, it will be asymmetric. There is no way you can control the asymmetry. Now, see. And now you start. I, I don't want, <laughs> no, no, exactly. But that is exactly the point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. I, so the, um, the, <laughs> we'll get that out later. Yeah, but that, that is the, exactly the, the point about getting committed. Exactly. Okay? You can see the cords are branching out in all directions, okay? So they're fanning out. They're also going to the underside of the leaflet, and that's why it's a particularly complex three-dimensional area. So and it was, easy, it, it was easy to get out uh, with while imaging. I was, with while I was imaging. distracting everyone, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what did we learn from this uh, case now? Yeah, so... I think what I've taken home the most is respecting the symmetry of the anatomy, um, trying to cross in caudal free zones to avoid entanglement, and actually having the range of clip sizes to be able to tailor towards the anatomy here. But certainly, symmetry and respecting the anatomy were my key messages from this session. Yeah, I mean, the, the last three minutes, again, if anyone has a burning question, we are very happy to answer. Otherwise, I would like also to point out uh, what you have seen today. I mean, this is a result of uh, hours, days, months of work behind the scenes of the people who have been setting up this, uh, this uh, simulation. Thanks to Abbott, who is sponsoring the session, by the way. But thanks to GE coming here with uh, uh, all tools. Thanks to LifeTech, thanks to Paolo Romidelli, who is a great guy, who really always uh, is uh, suffering my torture, sorry. Uh, but I like to do it. Uh, but again, uh, I would like to uh, again make one point about this procedure that we have seen. You know, the, the session is about unlocking the potential. And today, this procedure is not a, pal is not a palliation procedure. So you can't uh, uh, exit the room without a good result. You need to really work for perfection, try to get the perfect result. And this can be done. We have seen, uh, Martin, you showed us, for instance, that imaging is improving. Now we have uh, multi-planar reconstructions. Uh, Anya showed us there are different devices. Ah, it's a bit, um, uh, Maurizio, it's a bit difficult to choose which one. There is still debate. Uh, we, have we have been hearing about a uh, question about how to clock uh, the tricuspid in the posterior half of the valve, which is a, still a challenge. We need some art, but thanks to Andrew, who has been uh, uh, showing us uh, the anatomies, we now understand why the posterior half is more challenging. So again, I think uh, overall has been a, a good example on how using different tools, different uh, 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 modalities, we can uh, increase our knowledge and be ready to be more successful ne next time in our cat lab. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, everybody, for this beautiful session. Thanks. <laughs>